Hello, I'm Pierre Campbell and thank you for visiting PierreCamp.com and watching the Pierre Camp channel. This is our leadership network. I have the pleasure to introduce you today to a true achiever who's overcome major challenges in his life. He is the Chief Operating Officer for Brighthammer, a venture management firm who specializes in marketing and sales. But he's not only the Chief Operating Officer for Brighthammer, he's a loving dad and a, a loving husband as well. He was also known as one of the top five Dale Carnegie trainers, which is when I actually met him a couple years ago where he became my Dale Carnegie trainer. And he's also one of the, a nationally known motivational speaker. So you could just imagine how I, I was excited about regularly attending his class every week. <laughs> but, and what, I wanted, what we wanted to talk about is your, your, uh, your view on leadership. And bef but before we go into your view on leadership, Patrick, I want to thank you so much for, you know, your hospitable ways and just having me at your home. You know, this is this it. is a great opportunity, and I just want everyone out there to know how deeply you you've impacted my life. Thank you. Uh, one of the sessions that we had, I don't think you know this, but you you've <laughs> you've said some really reassuring words to me, and it was three words that really touched my life. And I was going through something personally while I was in class that time and those three words were you can do it mm, that's great you can do it you didn't know you were basically reassuring everyone or motivating everyone like you always do in <laughs> class but you you just came out and said you can do it and you looked right in my eyes and at that time I really needed it and I wanted to Thank you for that. You are very, very welcome. And obviously, you've done it. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Whatever it was, you did it. <laughs> yeah, well, well, I had a great coach. So, I, I, and I really, well, have a great coach. So, I really appreciate that. So, let's talk about your, lead, your, your views on leadership. How would you define leadership? You know, I look at leadership, um, first off, as leading oneself. Uh, and, and that is having a direction to go in. I think a lot of times people do not necessarily, they're looking around and they're diffused of ideas and they're, they're trying to figure out exactly what they should do or, or where they should go. And, and the core of leadership is, I know where I'm going. I know what I'm doing. I've got something off on the horizon that I'm shooting for, something bigger, something greater. Um, and, and, it, and it's not necessarily completely concrete, like I want a Mercedes or I want to live <laughs> in this part of town or I want to do this. Right. Um, I, th I think leadership of oneself which is the ability to direct oneself in actions on a consistent basis right is absolutely uh, fundamental before you can start leading other people so when i look at leadership and i have to define leadership the first thing is is i, I talk about it in terms of control of oneself yes. the ability to direct one's mind one's body towards an end towards a specific objective not to live life's lottery which is <laughs> to take whatever's coming along right but to be able to point to something and say, I'd like to go there, I'd like to try this, I'd like to do that, and then move oneself in that direction. From there on out, what leadership ultimately becomes is, how do you enlist other people to help you to get to ultimately where you want to be? And the, the dirty little secret that, that nobody really says uh, is, before you can get what you want, you have to help a whole lot of other people get what they want. That's true servant leadership, which is, if I help you get to where you need to be, then ultimately you'll help me get to where I need to be. That's leadership. First to self, then to the world. I agree. I totally agree. And I like the fact that you, you, you pointed out the little dirty little secret that you have there <laughs> where you help others. And the more people you help, then you'll, you'll get helped in return. I really appreciate that. Yeah. Patrick, can you remember a leader that you admired that left a profound lasting impact on you? Yeah, actually, uh, uh, there's a bunch of them. I'll, start, I'll actually start off with a guy by the name of Gene Cook. Um, Gene Cook used to own the Dale Carnegie franchise in Richmond, Virginia. Uh, he actually died on Millennium Eve. Wow. Uh, right, so <laughs> December 31st, 1999. And you know, here it is, it's 11 years later, and I miss him profoundly, profoundly. And he had such an impact on me for a couple of different reasons. Um, but one of them is because he made me bring more to the table than I thought that I could. And uh, uh, I had just come on board with the Dale Carnegie organization. This is in the early 90s or so. And uh, they had a class that they were putting together in another city. And he said to me, he goes, there's only about 20 people in the class or so. Normally you have about 40. 
And he said, Patrick, he goes, would you like to go up to Charlottesville and finish this thing out? I know you've only been with the company for three weeks, but you know, wow. why don't you go ahead and do that? And I, I said to him, I said, sure, Gene, you know, I, I'm glad to do it. And I went up there, and when I, when I got up there, I realized there weren't 20 people in this class. There was about four. Right? <laughs> so, so it was a lot harder than I had expected. So about five or six weeks later, I reported back to Mr. Cook, and I said to him, I said, Gina said, uh, he, uh, I said, I'm thinking I'm ready to go for this class. He said, when are you going to do the orientation? I said, well, I'm going to do the orientation next Tuesday night. And he said, how many people have you got in the class? And I said, well, I've got 36 in there. Mm. And he said, well, you can't orientate the class because you've got to have 40. <laughs> right? I was like, he goes, you're going to have to push it off a week. And I said, Mr. Cook, I said, I, I can't push this thing off a week. I said, if I do, I'm going to lose four, right? And that'll knock the class down to 32. Right. And he looks at me and he goes, well, it looks like you got eight more to get. <laughs> right? And it was such a strong um, point of leadership for me that I, I really locked on with him at that moment. Because what it showed me is, is that a, a leader is not afraid to make a hard decision. Right. And the hard decision of giving up the four to gather eight to do the right thing was, was far more important to him. And that had an indelible impact on me. Um, and it lasted me throughout my Carnegie career and even into today, which is you gotta, a leader has got to be able to make the hard decision. Right. Yeah, and a leader has got to be able to make the decision that is going to best impact the, the, the whole of the group and not just necessarily the, the individual. That's right. That's right. And one of the things that I really admire about you is your strength and motivation. Where does your motivation come from? It's a, it's a, <laughs> some people would say lack of sleep. <laughs> yeah. um, it comes from a deep seated uh, driving ambition to help people. Uh, and it has always been that here. It's a, um, I look out, I, you're going to think I'm crazy. I mean, you really are. My wife and kids think I'm crazy about this. <laughs> is I, um, as you notice, I drive a truck, right. right? And I've driven a truck forever, right? Uh, but in the back of that truck, if you didn't notice, was a couple of gallons of gas and, <laughs> Smart and <man>. jumper cables, <laughs> right? It's not for me right now, yes. Um, I'll stop and help any disabled vehicle. Awesome. Because, you know, or, uh, or, or uh, to some degree, I even pick up hitchhikers, right? Just because I know that I'm bigger and I move faster. Right, right, right. <laughs> right? But, the, but the point of it is, is that what leadership means is that you are looking out there for people to help. You are looking to extend yourself out there and making sure that the, that the people around you are well taken care of. Right. Um, and that, to me, really is the essence of, of where it comes from. The only way that you can do that is that if you do have the motivation, as long as you've got something in the distance that you're heading towards. And for me, that's leaving the legacy, the legacy that anybody that I touch, no matter how briefly, right. Their lives, their lives are made a little bit better as a result of that interaction. Maybe it's giving a guy a can of gasoline. Maybe it's telling a guy that he can do it. Right. Maybe it's, uh, uh, maybe it's, you know, surreptitiously kind of sending somebody some encouragement that they need. That's right. Or maybe it's tying somebody together with someone else because they're a good resource for them. The point of it is, is that each, uh, each act of that generosity, each act of that, um, um, that type of leadership for me binds and steals even more motivation to help more people. Excellent. Excellent. Uh, you know, that's, that's really important when it comes to leadership is the act of giving. The act of giving is the true essence of leadership, right? We talked about servanthood leadership as yes. well. As a chief operating officer, what are some of the challenges that you're facing right now that, that as a leader, what are some of the challenges that you face? You know, it's interesting about, let's, let's talk about leadership beyond, beyond just the company, beyond just Bright Hammer. Right. Um, part of it is leading people out of a malaise that they're currently experiencing. Um, I gave a speech to the International Council of Shopping Centers up in Washington, D.C. Uh, earlier this year. And uh, there was an audience in there, and, uh, pretty big. It's probably yeah. seven, eight, nine hundred people in there. And they were very quiet. It was a very quiet audience. And you could see that in the real estate business, it's been beat up. I mean, you've got yeah. foreclosures, you've got things, just, you know just collapsing in around you. And people are in a general, um, funk is the wrong word, but they're generally fearful yeah. for what's going on around them. And so I think being able to walk into a situation and not be Pollyanna, there's a huge difference between going out there and saying, it'll be fine, right. it's gonna be great, right. and being able to walk in and just say, this is the path forward, this is the direction that we can go. 
Here are the good things that we're doing. Here's, right. the, here's what we've got on the horizon that we can take advantage of. Here's the way that we can disrupt a market and take advantage of some of the disparities within it. That's a hard thing for a leader to be able to do because everybody's going to look at you and go, what are you, crazy? What are you, out of your mind? Right. But part of it is not only selling yourself, but it's selling them on the future and what the future can, can uh, hold. And the problem is, right now, you've got a huge n uh, number of people in the economy yes. that no longer believe it. They no longer believe that you know, there is something out there that they can, they can move towards, that they can grasp, that they can get a hold of. Right. And, and so the woe is me mentality steps in. And that's a hard thing for a leader to overcome, is to be able to say to them, no, let me, let me show you what you are. Let me show you what can become. That's a challenge. But it's a challenge that I think everyone can, uh, can certainly rise to meet if, they, right. if at first they understand where they themselves want to be. So what exactly do you do when you're, when you're trying to help uh, leaders or people that you're speaking to at conferences? What exactly do you do to help them to overcome their challenges? Sure. Confidence, um, I, and I've written this up, confidence comes from one of two places. Yes. Confidence comes from either a plan or it comes from results, right? That's it, one of the two. You can read all the books that you want to read, but basically that's where it is, mm -hmm. right? As a matter of fact, I do an entire session on plan versus results. If you've never done something, Right. Okay? If you've never done something before and you're, you're nervous about trying to achieve it, right? the only thing that you can do is to, is to create a plan that's going to say, when I succeed, this is the direction that I'm going to go. Or when I fail, you know, this is the contingency plan that I have in order to succeed. Right. Right? And it's that plan of understanding, yes, I know that things are not always going to go perfectly and things are not always going to fail, but I have at least a pathway to take that allows me to get my confidence level from a zero, maybe to a one, to a two, to a three, because that at least allows us right. to jump out of the plane, you know, metaphorically. <laughs> right. right. The second thing is, is that when you look at the results that you have, and you say to yourself, okay, well that worked out, that starts to build our confidence pretty significantly. So now the thing is, is that if I'm trying to attempt something that I've never done before, but I've done something similar, I can take a certain combination of, here's the game plan for getting it done. Here is similar things that I have done in the past. Merge those two things together and have enough confidence to go forward. And see, that's what we have to do with each individual, which is to say, let's take a look at your history and where you've been successful at various things. You've been successful in athletics. You've been right. successful in academia. You've been successful in all of these things. How do we apply these things to this plan? Right. And that's how you start turning people around from a leadership perspective. The number one thing that you have to be able to give them is confidence. Without confidence, all is lost. You have to at least have a fundamental belief that you can get from point A to point B. And the way to get there is through the plan and look at the results that you've gotten in other, in other areas. How did you build your confidence when you had that challenging situation in your life when you first moved to Richmond? When I first moved to Richmond, you mean when I threw the dart and it landed on Richmond and I moved here, right? And I was just like, yeah, oh, there you go. <laughs> I just arrived, right? The, uh, um, I had just left my job in, in Manhattan or in uh, New York City. Right. And, uh, and I called my girlfriend at the time. She's now my wife. And I said to her, I was like, I'm moving to Richmond, Virginia. And she says, who do you know? And I'm like, I don't know anybody. She's like, do you have a job? I'm like, no. <laughs> you have a place to live? No, I don't. Classic leader. That's right. <laughs> I burned the boats. Go. We're going. That's it. Um, and she was living in Detroit. I was living in New York. And, uh, and, and I said to her, I was like, do you want to come down here? And she was just like, well, call me tomorrow and I'll figure it out, right? I'll, 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 I'll let you know. She took it as an implicit you know, marriage proposal. Right. Which, <laughs> which eventually happened. Um, you know, but you, you go on things in the past that you have done, which is, okay, I know that I've picked up and moved before. I can do that. I know that I can network and talk to people pretty effectively, and I can do that as well. I knew that I did relatively well in school. So to be able to pick up and move into a new circumstance, into a new place, um, it, it seems a lot more difficult than it actually was. Um, I think the hard part, though, was the being unemployed for that period of time. Right. And just starting to say, oh my God, you know, what's my <laughs> worth, what's my value to the world, etc." But then eventually you start to realize, okay, this is ultimately where I want to go. Right. And that's where I started. On June 27th, I'll never forget it, June 27th, 1993, I sat in the room of my apartment in Richmond, and I wrote out exactly the way that I wanted my life to be. And I wrote it right down to the kids, the wife, 
everything, the house, everything. And you're living in it today, or right. you're, 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 you're here today, and right. you, you've seen that that came, when you read that list, it comes directly off of that list. Right. The power of intention. Yeah, and that's, you know, it's funny, wow. it's, it's true. The power of intention, and even Jim Lohr's book, you know, the power of full engagement, right. which is the management of your energy over that's a period right. of time. Um, but that was, that was the most difficult thing, was starting with just that one spark of coming in and saying, I don't know anything about this place, I don't have any of the resources that the average person would have, and then starting to coalesce those things and put them together, you know, and then starting to build out from there. But I think, I think more people than not can achieve those things. Yes. I think what happens is, is that we typically tend to beat ourselves up over, this is my fault, I made a mistake, I'm a terrible person, as opposed to, this is what I've done really well. <laughs> this is the thing that I'm really good at. Right? Here's some things that I don't stink at. <laughs> right, right. And that's a, um, it's an exciting place to be because I think once people start to realize that, that is what empowers them. And that all they need is a spark from someone else, someone to say, you can do it. Right. right? You can do this thing. And, and then they're off and running. And then, you know, they don't, they don't need much more than that. Does that make sense? Yeah, that makes a whole lot of sense. And then you hit a challenge, a major yeah. health challenge. Talk to me about that major health yeah. challenge. I really, really want everyone to understand the fact that you are a true achiever. And when I say true achiever, you'll understand by this story. Yeah. The, uh, I was working for Dale Carnegie. I loved working for Dale Carnegie. Right? It was just great. And it was shortly after Christmas. And uh, we were in the office cold calling. Right? <laughs> just like anybody else, you're just cold calling. Now, I have a little different opinion on cold calling. I personally like it. Um, but uh, my coworker Rob, was right across, the, uh, right across the aisle from me. And I hung up the phone and I said to him, I said, don't we have the most amazing job? And he looks at me and he goes, what? He go, I, said, I said, we have the greatest jobs in the world. And he, he says to me, he goes, Patrick, he goes, we're cold calling. <laughs> <laughs> you idiot. <laughs> right. You idiot. He actually used that word. Right? He goes, you cold call. You're an idiot, right? And, uh, uh, and he, goes, he goes, what are you talking about? And I said, it's incredible. I said, the only thing that we need to do our jobs is our mouths. Right. I, said, uh, I said, we could sit here, we could talk to people on the telephone, we can get them into a class. We could, if we were in a wheelchair, I said this to him. I said, if we were in a wheelchair, we could roll ourselves up to the front of the class, turn around, and start teaching. Right. And he literally goes, he goes, you're an idiot. And he slams the phone down, and he picks it up, and he starts dialing the next one. And, uh, you know, and I, I didn't really think that much about it until the next morning. The next morning, um, I got up, ready to go to work, and I fell out of bed, Pierre. I mean, boom, right to the ground, right? And uh, I thought it was kind of funny because, you know, you usually fall out of bed when you're in college. Right. <laughs> <laughs> we all do. <laughs> That's right. But the, uh, uh, so I get myself up and I go to take a step towards the shower and boom, I go crashing down to the ground again. And my wife kind of, we had only been two months married. She, uh, she looks up and she goes, are you okay? And I said, yeah, yeah, yeah. I said, I'm fine. And she kind of cocks her head and she looks at me and I stand up again and I, take another step towards the towards the bathroom and there was a dresser at the end of the bed and boom I went into the dresser and I went down and she's like are you okay and I said yeah I said it's no problem I said I think my I think my legs fall asleep it's no big deal right I stand up there's a trouser press that was right next to the dresser and bam I went crashing to the trouser press down to the ground now Kate she is up she is alert she is alive and she goes are you okay what do you want me to do now I'm getting a little nervous and what any newlywed husband would say to his wife uh, when they were in trouble, call my mother. <laughs> it didn't go wrong at all. <laughs> Mama's <boy. laughs> That's right. But the reason why I said that is, is because right. my mom's a medical professional. Right. And so I knew that, you know, if I needed something, she would be able to get it to me, and et cetera. I pick up the phone, I call her. Well, Kate dials the phone. And, uh, and I said to my mom, I said, she goes, she goes, hey, honey, she goes, it's awfully early for you to be calling. And I said, yeah, I said, I think for some reason, I said, it's like my, my, my leg is falling asleep, you know, and, uh, you know, my right leg's falling asleep. And she says, okay, she goes, it should be okay. She goes, I'll tell you what. She goes, why don't you have Kate take you down to the hospital right now and give me a ring when you get there. That's the way she said it in her tone of voice. Real smooth. Yeah, real cool, <laughs> real, real cool. good, everything's good. Right. right? So, and you see me, I am 260 pounds, yeah. right? I'm a big guy, <laughs> big six guy. foot four. And, uh, and, you know, my wife is 5'10", 125 pounds. She's wow. very thin, very slight. 
She uh, helps me get dressed, and then she picks me up and carries me down two flights of stairs, puts me into the truck, and we drive to St. Mary's Hospital. And, uh, and I'm, I'm all frustrated. It's all get out, right? Because I'm like, oh, I've got a busy day. I've got four appointments. i got stuff to do. I'm ready to go. And they say to me, they said, well, you know, Mr. Warren, we're going to have to admit you. I'm like, I don't have time for this. So they admitted me, and I was in the hospital for, uh, for a period of time. And uh, Kate never left me. Uh, she stayed right in the room with me. She slept. And, uh, you know, on New Year's Eve, she snuck a little champagne in there. It was good, right? You knew the marriage would work, That's right. right. <laughs> so we were having some, you know, we were, you know, it was a, uh, uh, but it was very difficult because they couldn't really figure out exactly what was going on with me. Right. And uh, so on the 2nd of January, it's about 4.45 in the morning or so, and Kay just looks up. She's had, she's had a week of just awful sleep, right? And, uh, and she just says to me, she goes, Patrick, she goes, I'll tell you what. She goes, you know I love you, right? I was like, yes, dear, right? <laughs> she goes, I got to go home. <laughs> so she left. About 15 minutes later, 5 o'clock in the morning, in walks my doctor. And he walks over to the window, and he looks out the window, and he turns around, and he says, how you feeling? I said, I'm all right. And he said, can you stand up? And I said, sure. And I throw my legs over the side of the bed, and I stand up. And he said, uh, can you sit in that chair right there? And chair, uh, Pierre, the chair was not more than five feet away from me, right? Wow. Not far at all. Wow. So three or four minutes later, I arrive at the chair, and I sit down, and because uh, it took me that long to get over there. And he sits right as close as you are to me. Right. And he said, Patrick, he goes, we figured out what happened to you. He said, uh, you've had a stroke. And I said, a stroke? I mean, it was, the words were like a death sentence, right? We're like a death sentence. Right. Uh, because I'm thinking to myself, I am 27 years old. I, am, I just got married two months earlier, right? Uh, and I'm like, I'm like, oh, my God, what do I do? And I just burst into tears. I just start crying, right? And uh, the, she tries to settle me down a little bit, but I can't. I'm trying to understand it. He has to continue on his rounds, so he gets up and he goes on his rounds. A minute later, a Catholic priest <laughs> comes and sits down across from me, right? And I'm like, oh, this is divine intervention, right? I can't believe it. Here's divine intervention. <laughs> Doesn't occur to me I'm at St. Mary's Hospital. There's right, Catholic right. priests under, like, you know, under every bedpan. Oh, look, there's another one. And I was, you know, but uh, the doctor had done a smart thing. He had told this, this priest... Uh, Father Jim, he said, he goes, he goes, I got to tell this 27-year-old kid he just had a stroke, and he's pretty debilitated, right? And Jim comes in, and he sits down. But I'll tell you what about the stroke, right? It was really interesting. Um, my mother had diagnosed it over the telephone. It's because mm -hmm. when I called her, and I said to her, Mom, my right side's falling asleep. But when I said to Kate, I think my leg is falling asleep, right. it didn't come out that way. Well, the way that it came out was... Man, my head was so fatigued because I had lost all control of my body on the right hand side, from my mouth straight down my leg, my arm, everything was completely disabled. My mother heard that, knew it was neurological. That's the reason why Kate cocked her head at me because she couldn't understand what I was saying. Right. That's why my mother diagnosed it over the telephone. She knew it was neurological, got me to the hospital, probably saved my life on that. Absolutely. And so now I'm sitting there going, you know, Father Jim, is, is, I'm, I'm crying my eyes out. Jim's sitting across from me, and he said, he goes, why are you crying? And I said, I had all this potential, right? I had all this potential. And he goes, what makes your potential any less today than it was a couple of days ago? And I said to him, I speak for a living. It was a week ago, just the day wow. before the stroke happened, that I said to Rob Pierre, don't we have the greatest jobs in the world? The only thing that we need is our mouths. And the very next day, I couldn't speak. Okay. That was a tough time. That was a very, very difficult time. And I'm sure he comforted me, and I'm sure that, that it, you know things went through my head you know, in terms of that potential. But uh, um, it doesn't help when you're laying in the hospital and you can't feed yourself because the spoon is going into your ear. It doesn't help when you can't dress yourself because you're right-handed and, and you can't control your hand. Right. And I'm very fortunate, right? Very fortunate. I've been able to make my way back. My hand is pretty, uh, is pretty good. My leg is back. And for the most part, my speech is back. Right. People who have known me for a long time, they can hear the slurs when I get tired. Um, but for the most part, you know, most people can't tell right. uh, what it is. But it, Part of, of setting a goal, part of being a leader is leader lead thyself. And part of, of getting well is saying there's something on the horizon that I want. 
I have never been in this situation before. I have no plan. <laughs> right? Right? I, I, I have no results right. to, to say that I can recoup from this. Right. But I've done other hard training things. I've trained to be an ocean lifeguard. I've trained right. to do triathlons. Mm -hmm. I've trained you know, to play soccer and skiing all my life. I think I could probably get that back physically if I do that. The plan starts to come together. And that's where the true leadership starts to come in. Which that's is, where it comes in. It does. Here's the plan. Here's the results. Okay, let me apply it towards something I really want, which is to be able to walk, talk, and write again. Right. <laughs> right. Put it out there and, uh, and then be able to follow that path. But first, I, you know, I, how could I lead Kate or anybody else? Or, uh, do it? You can't until you say, get up out of that bed. Does that make sense? Yeah, it makes a whole lot of sense. And that's the reason why I, I really wanted you to talk about that because it, when you go through something like that, that's that challenging and it's touching because that's your career, that's your job, that's, that was everything for you, as you just said. Yeah, I mean, you think about this, two months earlier, the, the, the other priest goes, in richer or in poorer, right, right, right. <laughs> in sickness or in health, <laughs> right? right? And, uh, and, uh, you know, and you say to yourself, well, I didn't think sickness and health would come so soon, <laughs> right? Yes. And then you get the stack of hospital bills and you go, or richer or poorer either. <laughs> and that, right? built, that built a lot of strength. That built a lot of strength. It did. Um, because I think that's, a, I think that's part of, uh, of the formula as well, which is surrounding yourself with really excellent people. Yes. You know, in this case, um, my parish priest uh, um, was, was very important to me in this case, uh, Father John Leonard. Kate very important to me. My mother being able to get me through this. My family being able to help me get through this. Right. Um, my coworkers. You know, you surround yourself with very supportive people. See, there are a lot of people out there who their own self-esteem is built up by tearing other people down. Right? If, if you can't achieve it, that makes me feel better about my station in life. Right. You got to try to carve those people out of your life. Any of that negativity, you got to get rid of it. And and, and it's unfortunate at the time because it sounds kind of cruel. It kind of sounds kind of sad. It's like, can I save this person? Right. right? They're so negative. They're so terrible. You know, or, you know they're, they're feeling terrible about their circumstance or whatever else it is. But the fact of the matter is the first rule that you are taught as a lifeguard is to keep yourself safe. That's right. right? That's the first. Don't get in the water with That's them. That's right. Right? That's right. And so, you know, when you are surrounded by people with negativity, you unfortunately got to let those folks you, you got to purge them. You got to get them out of your life. Surround yourself by people who believe in what you're doing and believe what you can do and, and are not threatened themselves by your own achievement. And, uh, and that's, a, that's another leadership aspect of this thing, which is to make a choice and just to say, this person can help, and this person cannot help or cannot drag me down. It's a very difficult thing to do. Right? Yeah. Very hard to do. Definitely. That, that's definitely a very difficult thing to do. And I want to make sure that everyone understands that we know it's not easy. You know, <laughs> at the end of the day, we know it's not easy. And we worked really hard to get to the positive side of things, the optimistic side of things. And it takes deliberate choices. You have to be deliberate in your choices and saying, okay, I don't want these negative people in my life. Yeah. If you're speaking negative things, guess what? You're out. You could be you could be a relative, a close relative, but you know what? You have to make that decision. Am I right? Yeah, I think I think that's true, and I think it's and there's a difference between negativity and identifying the negative. That's okay? true too. It's a big difference, right? Because you know, in the path to somewhere, there's going to be hurdles and there's going to be pumps, there's going to be roadblocks and these things, <laughs> and you, you can have somebody who just goes, you know, nope, everything's perfect, you know, right. everything's all in, <laughs> everything is good, you know. But what a true leader does is they look at it and says, there's an obstacle right in front of us. All right. That's not negativity. That's objectivity, right? right? And the objectivity says there's a problem that's directly in front of us. Let's make sure that we've got a plan to be able to get around it, over it, through it, whatever else is. We've got resources. We've got all these other things. Negativity is, is the, oh, woe is me. How come I am here right now? Or, no, we'll never be able to achieve this. It is the killer of creativity. Yes. And, and unfortunately, you know, there are some folks out there that that is just their... You know, their nom de guerre, their, their, their name of war is, is oh, woe is me. And, and I, I, I just don't think that it's healthy to be around longer term. You know, as a matter of fact, when I was coming out of the hospital, the guy who met me there was a guy by the name of Doug Taylor. Right. And he was a fifth degree at the time, fifth degree black belt from Dong's Karate. I was studying karate at Sung Yung Dong's uh, karate studio here in Richmond. 
And Don's been doing this for like 45 years or so. Right. And uh, Doug meets me in the lobby, and I was like, hey, Doug, I just got discharged. And he goes, yeah, I know. He goes, I'm here to take you over to the doje. And I'm like, I don't want to see anybody. I don't know. Because like, you got to remember, I was still speaking like this, you know, with the slurs and everything else. And my right arm didn't work, and my leg didn't work. And I said, I don't want to see anybody over there. I'm just too embarrassed at my current state. I'm drooling. I can't eat. It's, you know, it's really bad. And, uh, and he goes, what do you think you're going to drive yourself somewhere? <laughs> he goes, I'm, I'm here to drive you. Right? right. So we went over to the studio, and they helped me put together a program for getting the strength back in my arm and getting the strength back in my leg and continue to pro progress towards my black belt. And, uh, and all very positive all very upbeat uh, and very supportive and got me through to my black belt. And I, I absolutely give them credit for my rehabilitation, uh, at least my physical rehabilitation. But that was a big goal that we were striving for. That right. was positive. Right. And I, and I think it was not, actually I know it was intentionally done. It wasn't by accident that you met him and, and, and the goal was set. And that's how you overcome things, right? Yeah. It, because it, you have a goal. And once you have the goal, then you, it's like, okay, my mind is actually focused on this goal, and I'm going to achieve it. Yeah. And you think, of, you think about their form of leadership to me, right? which was empathy, sympathy, understanding, mm -hmm. and I understand what it is that you need, and you know, we're going to help you through this no matter how hard it is. Um, tremendously powerful influence for me at the time, especially because there was a lot of discipline there. Now, you couldn't go back to 1994 and say, Hmm, I'm going to have a stroke and I better be nice to these guys because I'm going to have a stroke and I'm going to need their rehab. It doesn't, the world doesn't work, doesn't that, work way, that way. Right? right? The world works by you putting out some good things to other people. And then when, you know, when the time comes, it will come back. Right. But to, to do it without asking, to do it without expectation of return, you know, and that's, and that's also what a leader does. A leader Someone who is only looking for a return is a mercenary. That's right. You know, right? And there is a place in the world for mercenaries. There certainly is. I'm not going to deny them their place in the world. But it's not the kind of leader that I want to follow. Somebody who is only going to do it just because they're going to get paid or they're going to get something that's, that's in it for them. To me, what's the point of that? Right? So it, you know, it's not all about magnanimity. It's not all about uh, 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 philanthropy. But I'm going to tell you this right now is that if you have not already set up the social structures and social networks ahead of time before you get into trouble, then it is very hard to find a path out of there. And I'm also going to say from a leadership standpoint is that when, when you have the ability to lead yourself and have a clarity of vision and have the resources and have already built up the emotional bank accounts of other people that are around you, right. chances are they're willing to fall in behind you. This especially goes to leaders of companies. Yes. Um, because every company starts off, and this is especially true for people who start businesses, Pierre. Every company starts off with, the world is ours. We've right. got the greatest idea. We've got the greatest the team. Brain. We've got We're this. Take over the world. That's right. And then all of a sudden, they get like 10 punches in the head. Right. Right? I see this constantly. They get 10 punches in the head, and then all of a sudden, they're like, ugh. And that's when you really start to see the coalition, of the, uh, the coalescence of the team. Does the team actually come together, or does it fracture? And that says something a lot, uh, says a lot about the leader and whether or not they can hold that team together during a downturn. You know, maybe the company is raising money. Maybe the company is not acquiring customers as quickly as it, as it needs to. Maybe the, uh, they've got some bad press, or maybe they've got a bad product run, or whatever else it is. At that point, it's still going to be the leader's co uh, uh, absolute belief right. in what is going to happen with the company, with the product, that brings everybody together. And it's that gelling that's critical. And that's not something that just arrives. It's something that you build up over a period of time. Right. So with that being said, what are your major concerns with the state of sales and marketing today? You know, it's, it, you know, especially when you're talking about sales and marketing, is that you have people out there who believe that other people are not buying anything or that they're only buying on price or that they're only buying um, because they absolutely have to. I am not going to deny that there are situations where that is, in fact, the case. But I would say that they are the minority of situations. And so a lot of times between sales and sales leadership, the first thing that the, um, let's take it from, a, from, a, from an individual's perspective first, right. which is how do I lead myself in sales and marketing? How do I lead myself into this job in order to be as successful as possible? 
Well, a huge part of that is discipline. And discipline is only going to come from I've got an objective. I've got a plan. I've got results that I've got in the past. My confidence level is very high. I've got an objective that I want to try to hit. And then from there, it's just going to be straight up work ethic and a fundamental belief that the product can be sold out there, no matter what product it is. From a leadership standpoint, okay, from a sales management standpoint, let me tell you where I see companies failing a lot. Right? Is two ends of things, two, two thoughts of failure. Right. The first one is, well, we're just not selling because of the economy. Nonsense. All right? And there's all the math in the world that will show you is that only a certain segment of the market, unless you're Procter & Gamble or somebody really huge, a certain segment of the market is going to more than feed your company. All right? Right. So you, all you need to do is get it from your competitors. Right? <laughs> that's, the, that's the big thing. So the, you know, the first one is, oh, well, that is, that's just kind of sick. The second sin that I'm seeing coming out of sales management is you're not working hard enough. Work harder, work harder, work harder, work harder, instead of working smarter. Try to looking at the markets a little different way. And you can see that both of these things are a little bit, are, 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 are negative. As opposed to being able to say, okay, guys, here's the deal. Here is our market. You know, right? And it's in three circles. Businesses that we absolutely have to own. Business that we'd like to compete against. And then business that, eh, if we get it, that would be really, that'd be a nice thing. And it would add to our coffers. But understanding, in that center circle, we own this space. And right. none of our competitors are going to get into the space. And what do we have to do to own that center circle? See, to sales team members, that's inspiring. Because yes. now they have a very crystal clear objective. They understand what is the market space that we're going to own. Who are the competitors that we're going to go after? Who are the current clients that we are going to protect, no matter what it is, to keep the cash flow going? That's right. Does that make sense? That makes sense. So, so you know, that's how we start to correct sales leadership. And we're looking at that and saying, all right, that's good right there. Now we start going out to the second ring, and the second ring is, okay, now whose who's lunch do we want to eat? Right. <laughs> right? Start looking around. Right. You know, and then the third, the third concentric circle on the outside is, okay, what markets do we want to go into so we're never into this situation again? again. All right. And <clears throat> what happens is, is that end up, people end up just being a little bit too myopic, and, and they just tend to focus in on one or two things over here, and they end up beating up their own sales team members, and their sales team members start going away. I'll tell you the other thing is, and this is a true act of leadership, both in sales and, and, and for a company as a, as a whole, is that when to going gets very hard, yes. the first thing that companies cut is training. <laughs> right? First thing they do. And, and I'm not just talking about organized training, like at Carnegie or, or you know, Sandler or anybody else like that. Right. I'm talking about they even cut their own internal training. And if you think about the U.S. military, U.S. military is widely regarded as the finest fighting force on the planet. Right? That's right. We got the best stuff. What do we do? We got the best people. <laughs> we got it. We got it. It's all of that, right? So here's the question. Uh, and, and there's a lot of people out there that are battle fatigued right now between Iraq and, and, and Afghanistan. So there's a little battle fatigue out there, right? right? But what is the Army's job when we are not in a hot zone? Training. It's all they do. Training. That's their whole existence training. is training. That's, <laughs> that's, that's right. it. From that's day all one. they do is training. So, so For that one day. That's right. So you start to, so you start to say to yourself, okay, so guys, we're in a lousy economy right now. I'm sorry, we can't afford tanks, can't afford guns, right. can't afford Kevlar. So what we're gonna do, guys, is we're gonna we're just gonna hang around and we're gonna we're gonna play cards. Right. The army would never do that. Right. Right. None of the none of the armed services would ever do that. They're constantly training, and the country understands as a whole that it's that level of readiness, that level of preparedness that makes us the finest fighting force we have. Well, what's the difference between that and a company out there that is in the middle of either the war of a down economy or in the flush aspect of, a, of an up economy where they're, it's starting to come through? Training is paramount. It's constant. It's got to be one of those things where you're doing it every single day. Right? Yeah. Every day. I, you're a professional athlete, right? Absolutely. You were. You were a professional yes. athlete for yes. a while. <laughs> Would you take... A month off? No. <laughs> oh, but wait, it's the, end of, but no. it's the end of the season. The season ended, right? No. So the season Just don't ended. do that. All right. So you don't have to work out for two months until this next season starts, right? No. Yeah, because you, you show up at training camp, right? And you're and you, someone else has your job if you show up at the training camp. See, and, and and that's I think that's a lot of times that's what that's what leaders forget is is that we're always training. We're always trying to get better and trying to get stronger and. 
the inspiration has got to be, I know that you can get better. I know that you can get stronger. And here's the regimen to be able to do that. That's my take on leadership in sales and marketing right now. Right. And, and on the flip side of that, on, from a marketing perspective, people also, or companies also cut their sales budgets, yeah. their advertising budgets, right? Yeah. So they'll say, okay, well, we're not going to advertise anymore. Well, there's different ways of going about advertising as well. So uh, I, I totally agree with you on that. Yeah. That's, that, that to me is akin to entering Death Valley <laughs> and driving right by the last gas station. <laughs> right? They just go, no, we got to have a tank. We're in good shape. We'll make it, right? Right. You, you, you wouldn't do that. Right. You would never do that. It is, and, and, and what people don't realize is that the level of innovation that's coming in right now, I do a lot of speaking on innovation and disruption. And disruption being defined as how do you so completely change the way that you're doing business that it displaces all your competitors, okay? Right. Um, Amazon was a very disruptive in its, in its time. Right. Amazon was very disruptive to the market, right? Then, then uh, I mean, you take a look at any one of those things and they just say, all right, they changed the way that we buy books. You know, Zappos has That's changed true. the way that we buy shoes. That's <laughs> right? true. Um, you know, FedEx changes the way that the mail delivery was even handled. You know, before it used to take a week, then it took overnight, right? And then right. FedEx has changed that. Very disruptive technologies. And, and you know, when you're, when you're looking at the disruption, what it says is, is that I've got to get better now in advance of other things. And so, therefore, you know, the, between the training budgets and the development budgets and bringing on new people um, and making sure that you're always hunting and always looking for, Pierre, the best possible people in the market, and you're constantly bringing these guys on. Right. Those are destructive strategies because those are the things that other companies don't do. Most of them just kind of cinch their belts and try to hunker through and get through the tough time instead of going at it, going at it very aggressively. Yeah, so is that one of your concerns maybe? If looking into the future of your crystal ball, yeah. Patrick Moore and Crystal My Moore. crystal ball. <laughs> yeah, my, my crystal ball. <laughs> right, exactly. <laughs> looking into the future, one of your concerns or, or a major concern that you may have for – the state of sales and marketing. What what do you think that you that's a major concern that you see in the in the future? What do you think we're going to have a challenge with? Okay, I'll take I'll take out a particular industry and then expand it out from okay. there. Okay, um, pharmaceutical industry. Right, the pharmaceutical industry is under to some degree assault um, from a lot of different angles. Number one, you've got legislative assault, whereas a pharmaceutical rep can no longer buy a lunch for doctor's offices because there's quid pro quo involved. They're also under assault from the electronic medical records companies because now a doctor, when he's sitting there, he's, he's examining you and he's taking your pulse and all the rest of this right. and he says, you know, Pierre, you have high blood pressure. I'm going to prescribe for you a medication. Mm -hmm. And boom, that medication is now over at your pharmacy. It's your Walgreens or your CVS, just like, just like that. You know, what's really the pharmaceutical rep going to do? They used to have two-minute details, two-minute sales pitches to a doctor. Then they got knocked down to a minute. Now they got knocked down to 30 seconds, and now they can't even talk to the physicians at all. Right. So, so the point of it is, is that when you look at the future of sales and marketing, there are technological disruptors to sales and marketing. Mm -hmm. and, I, and the thing that makes me um, not nervous, but the thing that I think that I'm, I'm looking at the most clear, closely is how do sales and marketing people continue to add value? What do they do to add value? And a lot of it is going to be information. A lot of it is going to be the level of service that they're providing and the amount of, uh, and how a salesperson helps their client compete. Right? That right there, if yes. a salesperson can say, yes. stop thinking about, I have got to sell this particular widget to you, right. and say, in instead start looking at your business and saying, how do I help your business really rocket and accelerate? Those are going to be the ones that win. And my, my only concern is that we eventually wash our hands and just say, yeah, you know what, I can't do anything because the prescriptions are being filled by EMR. They, you know, I add no other value there. And, uh, and it's, it's important that we continue to have the, creati the creative thinking around sales and marketing that says, I will continue to add value to this relationship one way or the other. Because that is the way that's, gonna, that's going to be the savior of, uh, of that profession. Right. With that being said, what words of encouragement do you have for leaders out there that are watching us right now? Okay. One of the things I would tell them is, is I live by a mantra, right, of think bigger, all right? 
Think big. Always think bigger. It's like this house. <laughs> <laughs> right. Think bigger. Think. Uh, uh, if you're just thinking within this tiny little box right here, um, I hate the I hate the cliche of think outside the box. I think just just crush the box and make a bigger box, right? <laughs> it's like, who cares about that box? You used to say that in class. <laughs> yeah, I don't care. Just, just get it bigger. I think that's one of the big things, which is you look at it and you look at those three concentric circles, my market, markets we'd like to be in, and that's markets right. that and we're happy to get eventually if we can get there. What are you going to own? Well, think bigger. The second thing is is to think differently. Um, when we had, we had a pretty big apartment company a few years ago. And I remember when I had first come on board with that, with the apartment company, um, which I am, to this date, I'm still so proud of. And uh, we had one of the best teams in the industry out there. Uh, the company was Cornerstone. It was based here in Richmond, Virginia. And uh, um, we had 646 employees. And I got to tell you, I loved every single one of them. could probably name them all by name. And they were just wonderful people, great company. But what made that company great was at first we started off pretty small, but we thought bigger, right? Let's get <laughs> bigger. Let's get, you know, let's get, uh, let's, let's be a player in the industry. The second thing is, is that we thought differently. And when we think differently, um, when I first came out with the company, I had a, uh, a team meeting with the regional marketing directors. And I told them at that meeting that I would pay for any convention that they would want to go to that year. I think it was 97, 98 or so. And, uh, and I said, except for something in the apartment industry. Interesting. Yeah. And they, they had that same reaction. You know? <laughs> They're just like, whoa, what are you kidding, right? Yeah. They said, so we could go to the Automobile Dealers Association meeting. Sure, no problem, I'll pay for it. Right. You know, we could go to the Plastics Innova Inno uh, Innovation Seminar. Yes, no problem. What was really interesting is that the ones who took me up on that offer came back with radically different ideas for the for the apartment industry. I love it. And we started to implement those ideas. I love it. So, but if they would have gone to a standard industry event, they would have probably heard standard industry things. It's not saying that those things are bad. It's not at all. As a matter of fact, I'm a huge supporter, even today, of the apartment industry and apartment meetings and things like that. The point was, you got to think differently. And if you've got an idea that is being done in another industry and you're bringing it into this industry, well, this industry has never really thought of that idea, so it's completely new. It's not a new idea. It's just new somewhere else. That's right. But now it's new here. Right. And so what I would tell sales leaders is think bigger, <laughs> think differently, all right? Go out and look at other industries and say, here's a great idea that we can apply here. As a matter of fact, when you are interviewing people, there's two questions that I would ask. The first, the first question that I would ask is, what was the last training program that you paid for yourself? Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. I don't even care if it's basket weaving, I don't care if it's a cooking class, it doesn't matter. Because it, it tells me that someone is willing to invest in themselves, pay for something that they wanted to learn, go out and learn it and, and, and bring it in. And it also tells me is that they are still in a mode of learning. Okay, right. that they're willing to accept in ideas and they're willing to invest in themselves. Critical question. Anybody who answers that question to the negative, well, my company's already paid for it, or um, I really haven't done anything, I, I'm going to tell you right now, I check my watch to see how quickly I can land the plane and end that interview because <laughs> they're not going to come and work for us. Right. Okay? Second thing is, is when you are, um, second question that I, would, that I would be asking that is, what is something in your last job, no matter what the job is, Pierre, right. What is something in your last job that your company did so well, all right, so well that everybody respected them for it? And they'll say, well, we did this, we did this, we did this. And here's the follow-on question of that. How would you apply what your company did so well in that business to our business? That's right. Okay. Now what you're doing is you've just sent a couple of different signals. You've just said, this is a place of innovation, and I'm expecting you to bring your innovation. Transferable right? talent. That's right. Strength. And you've, given, you've started giving a culture of, hey, it's okay to try some ideas here. All right? So we talked about think bigger. We talked about think different. And here's the third one. Think. <laughs> right. A lot of people don't think. Yeah. And see, and that's, it, it, it kind of ties to the previous point, which is um, Jeff Foxworthy used to do this funny bit. Right, and he goes, I want to know what it is in a redneck's life that they just say, that's it. <laughs> that's all the information that I need, right? 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 And I remember laughing at that piece just that you did, right? 
And, uh, you know, and I, compliments to Jeff Foxworthy for that comment. Because it's not just it's not just what he terms rednecks. It's everybody. Right. At what point in our lives do we say, that's it. That's all the information that I need. And so what think means, think means actively. So the key is, is those three things. The first one is think bigger, right? right? <laughs> it's okay to want to own the universe. Right? <laughs> Number two is think differently, right? And the third thing is, is actually think. Because it, it, at some point in our lives, we stop thinking, we stop gathering new information. And we just say, time out, that's enough, that's all I've got. Right. And so the innovation ends up here just dying, right? And it's a, that's, a, that's a really hard place to be because when the innovation dies, what ends up happening is, is that that's when the enthusiasm dies, that's when the creativity dies, and that's when the business starts to spiral downward. So what would I tell sales leaders? Follow those three things. Any leader, right? A right. CEO of a company. I talk to CEOs of companies all the mm -hmm. time. I work with companies that are in a high growth phase and they're trying to figure out how to sustain it. I work with them that are in turnaround situations and they're trying to, trying to fix their businesses. I'm looking at ones that are bored in their businesses. They're flatlined and they're just like, well, what do we do now? All three of those situations. And it still applies. Think bigger, think differently, and think. Take in new information. Look without your industry. Look out in there and say, what can we bring it in? Because that's what inspires people. And ultimately what it really comes down to is leadership, is getting people to be inspired with the idea that you have, that picture that you have in the vision, the plan, the results that you've got, the, the personal leadership that you've demonstrated to say, wow, I think you can achieve this. That's what gets people to circle around you, and that's what gets them inspired to move. And frankly, that's what gets them performing even when things are down. Absolutely, absolutely. Now you can see why I've selected Patrick Moore and my dear friend here to be a part of the Leadership Series and the Leadership Network. So the three things, think big, think differently, and think. <laughs> <laughs> so I had to think about that. <laughs> I had to think about that. So if, if people wanted to get in contact with you, how could they get in contact with you? I'm really easy to find, actually. If you Google me, I'll come up number one or number two. It's not a mistake. How right? is that? How did you do it? <laughs> well, all right. We'll I, thought talk bigger, about I thought differently. All right, right, right. right. I figured that. The, I figured uh, that. Uh, no, I'm very easily reached, Jerry, right, at, at pbmorin at brighthammer.com. That's P as in Patrick, B as in Bravo, more in at brighthammer.com. Excellent. And, uh, and as I said, if you Google me, I'll come up number one, number two, right around there. And phone numbers and everything are right there uh, to, uh, to, to reach me. And I answer my own telephone. So Excellent. Show. Thank you very much. You've been extremely hospitable. I really enjoyed the time here. As always, you know, I always love being around you. You're a very inspiring leader. Thank I you. want you to know to keep doing what you're doing. Because you never know, your three little words can go with someone that's in your class <laughs> and push them and propel them into greatness. Thank you. So thank you very much. As always, be grateful and encouraged. Thank you for watching the Pierre Camp channel and the Leadership Network. I'm Pierre Campbell. God bless you. And remember, you are a leader.